somebody online asked a really good question. The question was, how do you know all this? How did you, how did you learn all this stuff? And that is a devastating key question. And like all great questions, it's quite a deep one. So let me answer that. The answer is all the stuff that I've posted, I learned, deduced by um, a very, using a very small skill set, a very small toolbox that comprises some mathematical methods and some understanding of the physical world. And uh, there, in all the stuff that I've shown, <clears throat> there's no math more complicated than high school geometry and uh, high school calculus and a little bit of high school algebra to understand how to manipulate uh, matrices, but that's all. And a basic understanding of physics, electromagnetics, and control theory. And I'm talking of those are university courses or college courses, but they're, uh, you don't need anything more than an introductory course, nothing more than that. Now, the math is used to represent the physical laws. They're intertwined. And um, uh, the, uh, there's no way to solve the equations that represent whatever it is that you want to study uh, in missile stuff or counter IED or whatever, or propagation, uh, to solve it with a pencil and paper or uh, uh, in your head. You're going to need a digital computer to solve the equations, the differential equations or the matrices or whatever. It's not something you do by hand. So that means also, in addition to knowing a little bit, it's a little bit of math and a little bit about physics and a little bit about electromagnetics and a little bit about um, uh, 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 control theory. In addition to that, you're going to need some programming skills. So just how to translate a mathematical model into a piece of software that runs and gives you an answer. And I will, by God, show you exactly how to code a control loop, a, 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 like a second order control loop, for example, right from the beginning all the way to the end and see the results. I'll show you how to do that in a different video. Uh, but you need to uh, have a, just a very little bit of knowledge about how to do that. And now you have a software model that represents, it better represent, it's meant to represent something that happens in the physical world. Is it worth anything? Well, the, to, to establish that, we need to do an experiment. And I'm reminded of a conversation I had right now in this moment, of a conversation I had with my friend John, who's very into guns. And I have no interest in guns at all, but he is, and I think it's valuable and worthwhile to talk to people who are interested in things that are different than I am. I'm scared of guns. So I said, with his vast knowledge of history and guns and weapons and so forth, I said, John, is there any way you could ever make money at this? So here's my little parable that bears on the scientific method and software and, and learning things. He said, uh, well, not really, but sort of. He said, well, for example, if there was a court case, and it's a murder case, and uh, if a gun was used, uh, supposedly used in the, as a murder weapon, then before the trial starts, and he could make money at doing this, being an, an expert on this, uh, an, a, a firearms expert would have to, certified, would have to take the gun to a firing range and fire one round into a backstop and collect the, the uh, bullet and, and, and introduce an affidavit into court that says the gun is capable of firing a lethal round because otherwise in a court case nothing exists until it's proven I mean there's a few things like people breathe air and they eat food but they don't have to prove those things but a gun as a murder weapon it does it, it, until you show that it can fire a lethal round that does not exist in the case so I thought that was a really interesting illustration of the connection between facts or measurements and reality and truth uh, anyway. And so it's the same for undertaking any of the things that I've showed videos about. The things don't exist until you prove them. So here's a piece of software. It's meant to represent something. Now you have to do an experiment. And this is to me maybe the most interesting part. And it's going to be part art and part science. But you have to design an experiment which will test the prediction of your software. If you want to, uh, you know, for, uh, here's an example, microwave propagation over the sea surface. So I went on, I, I did this and you can do it too, uh, no, no matter who you are. Uh, I went online and I looked for a, pro a propagation model. It's how radio waves bounce off anything and combine at a receiver from a transmitter to a receiver. It's called multipath. 
Here are the equations. I wrote them down in a way that I could understand them. And then I coded them in software. I turned it into a DLL. So now I have, in theory, I have a propagation model that I could use for missile simulations. We want to use these things in simulations to predict, to predict and investigate what happens in the real world. So next thing is to prove that to find out that the, whether the model predicts reality. Well, problem. Uh, here's the creative part comes in. I don't have an airplane and I don't have a missile seeker and I have been involved in those tests But the results are always classified so I can't use them even though I saw stuff I don't have it anymore and I, I can't talk about it in specific specifics, but I can talk about generalities so uh, So I, I don't and I, I can't replicate that experiment myself however What I can do is an experiment over asphalt I could do that and even though it's not a sea surface, it's still the same propagation model and it should, should still be able to predict how the microwave signals bounce off, for example, asphalt or metal or something else. So no plane required, no missile seeker, no nothing, just a couple of dipoles and some wooden test stands, which I built the test stands using wood from Home Depot and I have a friend who knocked together a couple of sets of dipoles at different frequencies and I, I begged uh, permission to use a test range, an RCMP test range uh, near outside Ottawa where it's four lanes wide of asphalt in the middle of the woods and I went and I did the experiment with my father who turned out to be the best scientific assistant in the history of Western civilization. Uh, so we moved these test stands down the range and I measured spectra at about 20 seconds of spectra at one meter intervals from like one meter out to 150 meters. And then I wrote a special custom piece of software. I mean, you can do this too. You, you, you're, you're like the, the contract who can build his own bathroom. You just, just go and build your own bathroom. You don't need any permission. You don't need any money to do that. You can do it yourself. It's just time. So I wrote a piece of software to replay all of these recorded spectra at one meter intervals and draw a graph. So you could see the little measurement thing bouncing up and down at each range. And so that was like, a, I'll call it a live graph of my measurements, power versus range. And then I could overlay on top of that what the software predicted the measurement should be. Now I can compare the two and see how close they are. And that gives me some sort of evidence of whether the model is good or bad or good enough. And in this case, what I found was, wow, the model is astonishingly good. It's, it predicts the correct power at near ranges so to within a few tenths of a dB. So, uh, you know, this is called the scientific method. It's where you, you get an idea about how the physical world works and then you use your tools, whatever they are, your own imagination. Nobody can tell you how to do this. Nobody, you don't need anybody's permission. You can do it yourself. Um, and make a prediction about the physical world and then something maybe you haven't seen before that's best and then go and do the experiment and compare and if the uh, result m matches to your satisfaction or to the degree to that you need it to match matches the measurements then that is some evidence that your model is correct now you need more evidence you need many measurements under different circumstances to build up confidence that the model that you have created using the math that you either derived or got from somebody else or somewhere else or worked on as a team whether it has predictive power in the real world and if it does and you find this over this period of refinement, then you can start looking at things where you can't do an experiment and ask yourself if this makes sense, could this be something real? And I have lost track of the number of times where I have done that with Engage, for example, and discovered like a prediction, a, a seeker effect or a propagation effect has showed up in the model and then it later shows up in the actual experiment. And I cannot convey to you the excitement of those moments. They are usually years apart, but it is just absolutely astonishing to see after all the math and all the work put into the software and the test and the experiments and analyzing the data, like understanding, presenting the data in a sensible way. Astonishing to see a physical thing behaving just the way the math says. So, Summary, how did I learn all this stuff? I deduced it using unclassified laws of physics, electromagnetics, thermodynamics, control theory, a little bit of statistical methods, uh, but n nothing advanced, nothing complex, all introductory stuff, but you build on it 
like, you know, building blocks. And you can discover in your living room, you can discover how the world works. Anyway, I hope this helps.